Welcome to The Savvy Sauce, where we have practical chats for intentional living. I'm your host, Laura Duggar, and I'm so glad you're here. Dwell is an audio Bible app our family recently discovered, and now we love it. Dwell's mission is simple, to help you get in the Word and stay in the Word. And I think that is the ultimate practical application for intentional living. Visit dwellapp.io slash savvy to get a 20% discount today. Happy New Year, friends. This is a special episode for multiple reasons. First, I'm joined by my favorite co-host, my husband, Mark Duggar, and we get to interview another husband-wife duo, Gabe and Rebecca Lyons. As national speakers, authors, and Christian leaders, these two model the importance of seeking God for the call He has on each of our lives, and then encouraging one another to go after it in obedience. Mark and I met Gabe and Rebecca last fall at a Rhythms for Renewal retreat, and we instantly asked them to be future guests because we couldn't wait to share their perspective with you. You're going to love their blend of spiritual insight and practicality, and you can expect to gain inspiration and ideas that originated from Rebecca's most recent best-selling book, Rhythms of Renewal, Trading Stress and Anxiety for a Life of Peace and Purpose. Here's our chat. Welcome to the Savvy Sauce, everyone. Gabe and Rebecca, we're going to just have you start us off. Will you tell us a little bit more about your life and your love story? Hey, guys. Great to be here with you. Hello. And yeah, so our love story, man, it began 25 years ago when I met Rebecca at college. (laughs) (laughs) You know, our story is one where we became really good friends for years before we ever dated. So we both had other serious people in our lives, but it was after the college experience of friendship and growing up a little bit that we realized it was actually, we were meant for each other. So that began our journey. And from there, we got married back in 97. So and we're go- almost 23 years. We've lived in Atlanta, New York City, and now Franklin, Tennessee, near Nashville. So, you know, our family's family of four, we have uh, 19 and 17 year old boys, 15 year old daughter, and then we adopted a little girl, Joy, who's now seven from China back two years ago. So our family's full when we're home at night. There's a lot going on, and <laughs> just like most people, but we do feel like we're at that season now after 23 years of marriage where we've, we've learned a lot about one another and, and how to support one another, how to try to see the gifts that God's given to each of us uniquely and help steward and sharpen those. And then also try to be good parents, you know, every, every day it's a, it's a new deal, right? Right. It's, you learn as you go. We got married young and I think we learned some things the hard way, but yet I'm, I'm really grateful that we did get married when we did. We had our first, first son when I was 26 and we found out six uh, hours after his birth, it was an emergency C-section that he had signs of Down syndrome. And so that was a diagnosis that was confirmed a week later. And that was our entree to parenting. And I would say over the last 23 years, we've really seen each other as just a partner in all things, all of life. So vocation, work, uh, parenting, like <laughs> both of us are like, I could not do this without you. You better not go anywhere. And it's just been a guiding force for us just through the years to watch that beautifully unfold in adding more kids or organizationally starting new nonprofits or just whatever we're kind of pursuing in life, we know that we're better together. So that's been kind of the guiding force for us. Gabe, so shifting to you first. So among other things, you are the founder of an organization named Q. So can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, we launched this organization back 17 years ago, and it's Q Ideas. QIdeas.org is our website. But essentially what we're helping do is equip Christians and specifically Christian leaders with how to think well about culture and how faith applies to all of culture and trying to help understand the times that we're in and know how to lead. And so that turns out to be a lot of different events that we host. We have a Q Media platform that's a subscription-based platform that allows people to access 
thousands of talks, podcasts that we curate and content that really helps a Christian be formed in how they think about the world today and then also have a way to have conversations with those they love, their children, their spouse, their friends around the cultural issues that most of our world's talking about, but sometimes it's hard to find space in the church or in our typical kind of fellowship gatherings to have room to talk about things like technology or sexuality or how to think about the role of media in our life. And, you know, so, so many of those types of just daily issues we're all wrestling with. Q helps create space to ask bigger questions. And that's what the Q stands for. It stands for questions. And we want to create space for people to talk and learn and go to the Bible and scripture to understand how to think well about confusing things. And you have such a unique ability to see things coming around the bend. So what issues do you see facing the church here in the coming days? Yeah, I mean, I care a lot about the future of the church. And as I see the coming season in the past year, we've seen, you know, the church get reformed in some ways, you know, whether it's the ways in which we gather together and meet to the bigger questions of what is the church and what does it mean for the church to go small again? What does it mean to start to gather in smaller ways, smaller communities? How do we get back to discipleship? I mean, these to me are the bigger questions facing the church that are good questions, things that we need to be wrestling with and really have probably gotten away with too long, not always having great answers to. And so I think a dynamic I see coming in the year ahead is more probably attrition where less people will be a part of churches. And yet those who are part of them are going to get more strengthened because there's going to be a higher intentionality on discipleship and shaping them. But then there's also opportunity for the church to start to expand into people's neighborhoods and communities in a way that in the past would have been hard to imagine. But I think as our lives grow probably more local in the future, thinking through local manifestation of community and how we actually add value to our neighbors and communities becomes a question the church can start to answer and step into maybe in a more significant way than it has had to think about in recent times. So those are a few things that I would I would see coming. Those are really helpful thoughts. And I personally just appreciate the two of you and your influence on the culture. You're both leaders and authors. And Rebecca, in your most recent book, Rhythms of Renewal, we've actually mentioned that on here before and recommended it long before you two agreed to be guests. But will you just lay the foundation for us and explain each of the rhythms and then share the biblical promises that are tied to each one? Oh, absolutely. So Rhythms of Renewal has been a 10-year journey of walking in freedom for emotional health because this came out of a decade ago having panic attacks and it slowly became a panic disorder that lasted about a year and a half, but God rescued and pulled me out of that pit. And so it was more about how do I reframe a life, reestablish a life of health that just meant I would need to conform to the boundaries of rhythm. And I think when we get outside of rhythm, you know, the way God established the world, chaos ensues. But when we stay within the constraint that God appoints for us, you know, when you think about a Psalm 139, he says, you hem me in behind and before you have laid your hand upon me. There's, there's an anointing in constraint and boundaries because therefore our flourishing. God really knows as a father, a good father, what is good for us. And it's not just to run amok and do whatever you want, but to understand that he he has order that he established the world with. So the four rhythms in the book are rest, restore, connect, and create. The first two, rest and restore, are input rhythms, and they build us back up. And that's usually what you know people are missing, are those input rhythms. And that's why we find a lot of burnout, a lot of fatigue, chronic stress and anxiety, physical symptoms of stress. American Institute of Stress says we have almost four out of five of us dealing with physical symptoms of stress. And now that's only heightened due to COVID in 2020. So those rest and restore are so important. And then the output rhythms are connect and create. And that's all about once we're filled up, how do we go back out? So kind of the biblical framework for that. So rest, restore, connect, create. So rest, God, you know, when he um, creates in rhythm in Genesis 1, evening, morning, we're the first day, the second day, the third day, the fourth day. At the end of that sequence, he says, then God rested and that day and blessed that day. And it's this concept that rest precedes blessing, that we don't run to earn rest. We run fueled from a posture of rest. 
And rest was never a option to God. It was a mandate. That's why he modeled it. He didn't have to rest. He's, he's God. But he did it to set a framework and an example that we would always be postured from a place of rest. In fact, Jesus in the new covenant says, come into my rest. Rest actually requires pursuit. It's not numbing out. It's not escape. It's not avoidance. It's actual intention for for abiding, an abiding life, and done in solitude, which is just based in relationship with God. So that's the framework for rest. We talk about everything from, you know, routines for deep sleep, practically, or a morning routine, or taking the Sabbath, remembering it, keeping it holy. What does that look like in today's day and age? And that's all for your spiritual health. Each of these rhythms are for a different kind of health. So rest would be spiritual health. Restore would be physical health. And I'm thinking about just like firm muscle, strong bones. Like in Isaiah 58, you'll be like a well-watered garden, a gurgling spring that never runs dry. This idea of you'll be restorers of old ruins. You'll make your communities livable again. This was a prophecy in Isaiah all about the fact that we are to be people who are restored so we can restore and have dominion in the dwelling place that God plants us. And so that's a vision for if you're strong in energy and health and vitality, like if you're stewarding your body as a temple and you're keeping it holy and you're you're eating food for fuel and you're sleeping and you're living within, like even eating what God <laughs> gives us for food versus just processed stuff all the time. All of this is just to be mindful of what we've been given as a body. And then when we're strong, when we have firm muscles and strong bones, we can be a part of making a community livable again. We can actually be restorative for others. So that's the goal in these input rhythms so that we can go back out. And then the last two rhythms, connect and create. Connect is all about our relational health. And, you know, we're a communal people made by a communal God and God has always dwelt in relationship. So um, where two or three are gathered, there I am with them in their midst, that it is not good for man to be alone. God always has called us to Jesus' model of disciple making and his best friends and then his disciples and just how we always create in community. We actually create in health healthy relationships. Marriage is a beautiful picture of that. Like we were just talking about, like Gabe and I create best when we are together and united on innovation and curiosity and lifelong learning. It's just, it's better together. So in that section, we talk a lot about marriage, health, parenting, health, uh, forgiveness, reconciliation, hospitality, even connection through embrace, whether it's hugs or just things we need to do to release that dopamine in the brain that says you you belong, you are loved, you are seen, you are known, you are held, you belong. And then finally, the last rhythm is create. And that's all about our vocational health. And I love how God, as a creative God, makes us in his image. And He puts that desire to create in us. And Psalm 139 just defines this so well when it talks about when God knit us in our mother's womb, his works were wonderful, and that our frame was never hidden when we were made by him in that secret place. It says, his eyes saw our unformed body and all our days were written and planned before one of them began, which means God calls out destiny in the womb. He sees those days. He appoints us with the unique birthright gifts that we will need to actually walk in the fullness of his invitation, the call, the vocare, the calling that he's entrusted to us. But, you know, we don't, he's never going to coerce us or force us. It's still up to us to decide, yes, I want to follow you, Jesus. I want to, I want to walk in the freedom and the boldness that the call is inviting me into and knowing that I'm not doing it alone and I'm not jumping ahead of God, but I'm just simply humbly being an obedient servant to whatever God has. So that's the four rhythms, rest, restore, connect, create. Again, those are spiritual health, physical health, relational health, and vocational health. And I think something unique about your book is that it's simultaneously deep and practical. And I remember One of the first ways the Holy Spirit really captured me while I was reading was when you had laid out the foundation of what the four rhythms are, but then you first recommend to take inventory. So why do you recommend that that's the first step before we do anything else? 
Well, you cannot heal what is hidden. And a lot of times we find ourselves spinning out, but we don't know why. So all we can say is we feel overwhelmed or we feel stressed out or we feel anxious, but we can't name the fear or name the pressure until we take inventory. So inventory is just quickly, it's four questions you want to ask yourself. We do this quarterly. I mean, you could do it annually, but I think with COVID, we do it quarterly actually, because I just think of it as a season, you know, just like we have spring, summer, fall, and winter. Um, Each one of those seasons brings a different approach to rhythm and work and family and all of those things. So inventory just asks four questions. What's right? What's wrong? What's confused? And what's missing? And the answers to that will look different in December than they did in August. And it's just a great way to just reframe, recalibrate for the days ahead. And I've learned through reflection and introspection that that is the moment that you get to auto correct some things. Blind spots are exposed, missed connections are revealed. It's God's kind way, it's the Holy Spirit's kind way of reminding us what is true and helping us make the pivot, make the change needed to continue to become more like Christ, to become a disciple that follows him, that's willing to constantly readjust and evaluate because I I love the words in scripture says, this is the way walk in it. You know, it's going to look nimble. Like our life of obedience is going to look nimble. We don't always know what God has around the bend, but he's asking if we're willing to submit to that and surrender to that journey and that path. And I have found that that's been the most rewarding way to walk out a life of faith. And I think those are such great questions, but could you maybe give an example, especially of the one, what's confused in case that is confusing to someone? Yeah. Confused is the one I get a lot of clarifying questions about. Confused to me is very much of a 2020 question. Like what was unexpected that you seem to be in that you thought, you know, things were going this direction and all of a sudden there was a left turn that feels like an interruption. Maybe you're caught in a transition and you don't have clarity for where you're going, but you know that it's the end of an era as it was. And there might just be a season of just confusion there to go. I'm not sure how to proceed. Naming that, getting specific about those confusing things. Maybe you have a relationship where someone walked away and you're not really sure why. That's a confusing thing. It requires more prayer, more contemplation. And it also requires going to other people and just asking hard questions. Maybe there's confusion because you haven't had a hard conversation. So it's going to look different to everyone. But confusion means like, what is happening in your life or in your year that you didn't see coming, and you're not sure what to do next. And now a brief message from our sponsor. Dwell is an audio Bible app our family recently discovered, and now I'm excited to get to share it with you. With loads of inspiring voices, Bible translations, and original background music, you're going to love listening to Scripture. Not all of our daughters are old enough to read, so we like to provide them opportunities to listen to the Bible as a way to make it accessible for each of them. I am always amazed at how much sticks with them when they're listening as they run around the playroom or do art together. But something that they've requested is to hear a female reading the Bible, and Dwell has that as one of their options. You actually get to select one of multiple voice options and listen to scripture anytime. And one of the most requested features, a sleep timer, is now available on Dwell. That means you and your family can fall asleep to your favorite books and stories of the Bible without losing your spot or draining your battery. So end your day with God's word in your ears and on your heart. You can even try it tonight. To get started with Dwell, go to dwellapp.io slash savvy to get a 20% discount. That's dwellapp.io slash savvy for 20% off an annual or lifetime subscription. So get it for yourself or gift it for someone you love. Either way, I hope you take your action step today. In case anyone's unaware of this, I just want to give a shout out to my husband, but Mark is a huge reason the Savvy Sauce actually started and the reason it continues because he continuously 
encourages me and nudges me toward action and supports me all along the way. And I've noticed that he and Gabe seem to have that in common. Well, you're sweet for saying that. I, I would say, Gabe, so you're not going to admit this, I know, on on this podcast, but you've had a lot of success in your own work and you're a sought after leader. So Gabe, how and why did you champion Rebecca even during a season where you were both so busy raising younger kids? Well, I, you know, I basically came to the realization, which was pretty ignorant of me for so long, <laughs> about 13 years in the marriage, but I, I just started to awaken to the reality that God had a really unique calling on Rebecca's life. And I think growing up in like a traditional setting of the church, uh, we always saw the male kind of lifted up and their calling and that, you know, you get married and your wife's there supporting you, providing for the family or pursuing the thing God's called you to do. And Rebecca had so faithfully been doing that for so many years, but I started to see that God really had a unique assignment on her life. And that was just as important and perhaps more important than the calling I had on my life and that I needed to adjust a bit of how I was seeing uh, our role together and that I had a responsibility in helping her become all that God had called her to be. And so that just began a conversation and a journey for us of of starting to reorient, you know, how we would parent, how we'd spend our time, how I would spend time and invest so that she could go get time for herself to, in her case, write, to create, to do the things God uniquely wired her to do. And, you know, as we've done that, it, it, that's become a little more normative, I think, in couples, but it's not it's not without its challenges, but it brings so much life when we are both creating. And I know for Rebecca's mental health, that became essential is this connection that many of us will suffer from anxiety or panic or even depression when we aren't really clear on the role that we have, the assignment maybe we have in life. And the more we can start to discover that, which sometimes can happen best through a spouse or a really close friend helping you see who God's called you to be and pointing out and calling out those gifts and then trying to help you manifest those things. So that's that's kind of where our journey began a decade ago. And it's been great to just see how Rebecca has flourished over these many years. And so have I. Like nothing's, it's taken nothing away from my life. It's only added to it. That's such a great example. So it sounds like, you know, you really began to encourage Rebecca and starting her writing and speaking. But then practically speaking, so what changed for the two of you to create space and margin to actually make this dream a reality? You know, it started slowly and it was the practical things that I think any husband and wife can do. It was it was saying, hey, I'll, I'll get up early with the kids this morning so you can have time to get coffee and to write or to read, you know, like these really practical, simple things that we would start to adjust about our day. Or instead of me just assuming this is our life now, that you're going to pick up the kids at three o'clock and I'll come home at five. It's like, no, I'll go pick up the kids these days at three o'clock and you you stay and get work done till five or whatever it is. I think we just shifted a vision of our family and our role as parents as being co-parents. You know, we're co-laboring together. It was a shift in just sort of stereotypical gender roles in a family where we honor the difference that we each bring to our family and to our marriage and to our parenting. But we also don't overdo that. We recognize it's a team. And so I would say those are the little adjustments that every week or two weeks, you know, we're kind of evaluating what do you need this week? And we ask that question a lot to one another so that we can ensure we can both have time for the rhythms to be practiced, but also we actually have the work time that it takes real time to get work done, to create things. And with both of us, are kind of in professions that require that ability to think well, to create the quiet space. And so we just try to build our calendar around that now. And it really sounds like biblical wisdom applied for both of you, just honoring one another. And Rebecca, it just makes me curious, were there any fears that you originally had, like right at the beginning when you were intentionally beginning to take the time to start cultivating these gifts? Yeah, I would say, you know, it was one day at a time, one month at a time. Gabe has just a gift of faith on him that he saw things in me that I wasn't quite ready to acknowledge. I do know that writing had always been my way of processing pain, processing growth, 
I've always kind of been a chronic overshare <laughs> in my friend circles, in my journal, and and it was almost I didn't know that that would have an outlet that might look like public consumption. I just wouldn't I would have never imagined that or thought through that. But he did encourage me to just think in that way, to have some conversations with some people, to to float, you know, some articles early on and just see what kind of the response there would be. Would it resonate? So it was just baby steps, quite frankly. But then over time, it just had momentum. And it was just because I think I was giving words or language to what people might have been feeling, but didn't didn't know how to articulate. So looking back, I, I know the gifts were planted in the womb. And I do I do know that I grew up called Becca Book as a kid. And I, I know now that readers make writers, but I just wouldn't have really saw that in myself initially. But it's like anything, um, like riding a bike, you, you slowly get more confidence the more you do it. And it starts to feel a little bit more like just part of who you are. And so I would say having someone who just continues just to encourage you in those early days is is very important. And I appreciate how you unpack that in your book. There was just this one quote I want to read in case somebody is starting their own thing right now and maybe they haven't received that encouragement that you got from Gabe along the way. But you write, it's so like the enemy after a long stretch of faith to threaten obedience with fear. And I just appreciate you working through those fears to make the book what it is now. Yeah, that was in context even to adopting Joy. When we said yes to adopting her, we were kind of towards the very end of like that final getting ready to go. And I just, it was like weeks before we were going to meet her for the first time after a year of planning. And I just all of a sudden was gripped in fear. And I think that's just the ploy of the enemy to try to thwart what God has already begun and set in motion and is faithful to accomplish. It's just like the last attempt to just like try to take somebody out. And it, and that's just a reminder to people who might be listening. You might have been dreaming of something for a long time and obstacles got in the way, but then God just made it clear this is where you're going. And then still the enemy doesn't ever stop trying to take you out. And it's okay once you start to recognize that. And I just constantly have to go back to prayer. God, I, I pray for faith over fear that you would shut the door. Otherwise, that the door stay open, that I would walk in courage and trust you. Patreon can be a tricky thing to explain. So let me try to boil this down. The time and financial investment our team gives to bring you all these episodes on the Savvy Sauce costs us hundreds of dollars and many hours each week. And we cannot fully cover that cost through advertisers and kickbacks from the purchases you make by ordering resources through our links. We do need other revenue streams to secure the future of this podcast. One easy way you can participate and support the future of the Savvy Sauce is through becoming a patron. We want to make this possible for anyone listening, so we have two five and twenty dollar levels available each month you can sign up with a few clicks by visiting the sauce.com then you click the patreon tab and then follow the prompts after clicking join patreon here thank you for your generosity in partnering with us so shifting gears just a little bit but even though you both are are so busy with this full life that you have of speaking and writing and traveling what kind of sacrifices have you both had to make in order to make that happen? Well, I think I think every family obviously makes these sacrifices for one another and for their family. I mean, you say no a lot more to things that otherwise you would have thought were great opportunities, but you start to say no because you're so clear on your purpose and your mission. So it becomes clarifying. And, and I would say, you know, we've had a couple moments in the last several years where we as a family and as a couple just said, look, we want to go all in. Like we don't want to just get comfortable here. We're going to move to New York city. You know, that was one of the big things our family, we made a decision to do that meant we were going to sell most of everything we owned and go start a new life in a city that was going to have some challenges to figure out with kids and everything. And and yet we did it and we were so grateful we did. Or when we adopted joy a couple of years ago, there was you know, it was looking at a future of our kids about to graduate and 
you know, the empty nest idea. And I think for us, we were like, no, let's go all in again. Like God's given us an invitation into adoption in a, in a way that will look different for our family. Cause our two, two of our children, our oldest, and then the little girl we adopted have down syndrome. And so it was a great opportunity to, to basically add her into our family and to give a buddy to Cade and to just have this great opportunity to invest in somebody else. And so I just, I think we want to live in such a way that we're putting things back on the table, taking risk that we don't know what the outcomes are going to be, but just trusting God and trying to walk forward in faith. And it sounds like it's sacrificial, you know, in the moment, but it, it always comes with a bunch of blessings. And so uh, it hasn't been hard to do. It's been very rewarding. And Gabe, earlier you had mentioned that it's more commonly accepted for us just to naturally support someone's dream if they're, even if they're a husband and father. But Rebecca, I know you and I shared a few tears on a retreat about having these strong passions for both motherhood and ministry beyond our homes at the same time. And so can you teach us the important lessons you've learned through the years as it relates to this topic? Yeah, I think everything happens in season. So it's about being nimble and knowing when to press the gas and when to press the brake. There have been for sure seasons where home required 80% of my energy and time. And then there were seasons where, you know, at least during a work day, it might only require 25% of my time because the kids are in school from eight to three. So I'm still structuring my work around family. I don't believe God calls us to things that abandon family, but what he will do is he'll fill in the gaps and bring people around to help support our kids, other voices in their lives, other people who can influence them maybe in more objective ways than I can because they're, you know, not emotionally attached. They can actually just have that neutral environment, which is so helpful. It really is true that it takes a lot of people to kind of put formation into our children. So because of that, I press the brake on work a little bit more in the summer only because I have the freedom to do that. Not every mother does. I can kind of levy the harder, like the more intense seasons during the school year. And then I can kind of pause. My mom was a school teacher, so she tended to be home when we were home, even though she was definitely full time year round. And it's just what I found to be helpful. So that's how I've just tried to be nimble in it. Again, the taking inventory practice is so important. I think specifically in this area, what are the balls that are being dropped? Are there any kids that are struggling right now? Who needs more time and attention in this season? What in work? What can I lay down and let go of? Because it's not it's not the most essential thing. Like that's just part of life. It's just going to require this constant adjusting if you want to walk in the tension well and not ignore some things that might be flaring up right in front of you. So we're only scratching the surface here on all you have to offer for both of you. So where can listeners find you both, find you online and your resources? Yeah, for Q and the work that we do, qideas.org is the best place to learn more about you know the work that we're doing as well as our Q media platform that I think any family or parents listening or people who are leading communities or the church or small groups, you know, it's the kind of thing that I think would give you life and help stir the pot on some important conversations Christians need to be having and want to have, but don't always know how to, how to have them. So, uh, and then on socials, just under my name, Gabe Lyons. Yeah. Mine is Rebecca Lyons.com. And it's pretty much where you can find everything. (laughs) I'll just leave it there. (laughs) Wonderful. We'll link to all of that in both our show notes and our resources tab of the website so people can easily access it. And we are called the Savvy Sauce because savvy is synonymous with practical knowledge or discernment. And so as our final question for the two of you today, what is your Savvy Sauce? I would say for me, best practices have been my morning routine. So journaling is part of what is this cathartic, actionable guide for content that may or may not make it in a book down the road. I never write in my journal for anybody but God, but sometimes he reveals things during those pages and insights that I meditate on for a season that sometimes turn into a bigger message. But that quiet place, that secret place, time 
in intimacy in the mornings has just been a game changer for me, a life source, a feeling that has set the trajectory for everything else I do. Yeah. And my, my savvy sauce is staying off social media. <laughs> I think that's, <laughs> that helps me have more time to read, think and uh, reflect and create. And so it's hard to do these days, but that's, that's the thing I'm trying to practice the most. Well, again, those are both deep and practical. And I just want to say that we are so grateful for both of you and the influence that you've already made in our lives. Gabe and Rebecca, you both inspire us to lean into obedience to God because you model what an adventure it is and how it blesses others and brings glory to him. So we just admire and appreciate you both. Thank you for being our guest today. Thank you for having us. One more thing before you go. Have you heard the term gospel before? It simply means good news, and I want to share the best news with you. But it starts with the bad news. Every single one of us were born sinners, and God is perfect and holy, so he cannot be in the presence of sin. Therefore, we're separated from him. This means there's absolutely no chance we can make it to heaven on our own. So for you and for me, it means we deserve death and we can never pay back the sacrifice we owe to be saved. We need a savior. But God loved us so much, he made a way for his only son to willingly die in our place as the perfect substitute. This gives us hope of life forever in right relationship with him. That is good news. Jesus lived the perfect life we could never live and died in our place for our sin. This was God's plan to make a way to reconcile with us so that God can look at us and see Jesus. We can be covered and justified through the work Jesus finished if we choose to receive what he has done for us. Romans 10 9 says that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So would you pray with me now? Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus to take our place. I pray someone today, right now, is touched and chooses to turn their life over to you. Will you clearly guide them and help them take their next step in faith to declare you as Lord of their life? We trust you to work and change the lives now for eternity. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, you are declaring, Him for me, so me for Him you get the opportunity to live your life for him. At this podcast, we are called Savvy for a reason. We want to give you practical tools to implement the knowledge you have learned. So you're ready to get started? First, tell someone. Say it out loud. Get a Bible. The first day I made this decision, my parents took me to Barnes & Noble to get the Quest NIV Bible, and I love it. Start by reading the book of John. Get connected locally which basically means just tell someone who is part of the church in your community that you made a decision to follow Christ. I'm assuming they will be thrilled to talk with you about further steps, such as going to church and getting connected to other believers to encourage you. We want to celebrate with you too, so feel free to leave a comment for us if you made a decision for Christ. We also have show notes included where you can read scripture that describes this process. Finally, be encouraged. Luke 15.10 says, In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. The heavens are praising with you for your decision today. If you've already received this good news, I pray that you have someone else to share it with today. You are loved, and I look forward to meeting you here next time.